Hey guys. Uh, so like Andrew said, I'm Katie McCaffrey. Um, I'm a distributed systems engineer. I just started at Twitter in January. Um, this is where you can find me on the internet. I totally do that if you want to talk to me or like read some of my blog posts. Um, but basically, um, I'm here to talk to you about the time I spent in the entertainment industry. And I spent about six years building Xbox games, um, including Gears of War 2, 3, uh, most notably Halo 4, and then I worked on HBO as well. Um, so I'm here to talk about this guy. I don't know why there's a color panel there. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is the Master Chief. He's um, a Spartan super soldier, and he lives on the Xbox and has his own whole series of video games. Um, in, I, in, in November of 2012, we launched an entire new Halo game called Halo 4. In addition to that, that was launched by a new studio called 343 Industries that I joined in 2010 to help figure out how to do this whole thing. And we also launched an entirely new set of services to power... Um, not only Halo 4, but the rest of the Halo universe and future games and experiences. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of the Halo services so you sort of understand where we're coming from, talk a little bit about the architectural challenges and some of the unique things you face in the games world. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a technology called Orleans that came out of Microsoft Research and why that was particularly useful for solving this problem. Um, and then we're going to tell you some tales from production because who doesn't like a good war story? I know I do. Um, and sort of how we survived kind of a very crazy launch. Okay. So a little history to, uh, to get us started as you are up to speed. The Halo series was created by a studio called Bungie. Um, the first game came out in 2001 on the original Xbox. Uh, Bungie then went on to create an, a host of other games, including Halo 2 in 2004, Halo 3 in 2007, um, and then a couple spin-offs, Halo 3 ODST in 2009, and Halo Reach in 2010. At that point, Bungie decided they wanted to go do other things, and other things turned out to be this really awesome game called Destiny that they just released this past fall. Um, but because people really like Halo um, and wanted to keep playing it, uh, Microsoft spun up an internal studio called 343 Industries to sort of take over the Halo mantle and continue this franchise onward um, and develop video games and books and comics and all these other things that people can interact with. Um, and so I joined the team at the beginning of 2010 to sort of help them figure out what does this next generation of Halo services look like. I was web service dev number two to figure this out. We were like only 30 people at that time. Um, so what are the Halo services, right? Um, if you play video games or if you think about this, uh, you get a disc that you buy um, in a box and you put that in your Xbox and there's code that runs on that and that's the game on disc. So it's like the typical experience. There's also a set of services that Xbox Live provides by default to any game developer who develops a game for the Xbox. So that's things like identity, that's your Xbox Live gamer tag, authorization, achievements, matchmaking services, things like that. Um, and then in addition, many games, especially the larger ones, will have their own set of services like Halo did. So we had a presence service. Uh, this was sort of like our heartbeat service. It told us what you were doing at all times. Um, it could tell us like on a frequency of a, a second to 30 seconds based on uh, if you have a, a second screen device connected. Uh, we also did things like we had much more detailed presence than the Xbox Live presence service. So we knew things like how many bullets you had in your gun and like what map you were on. And we used this to help you join your friends' games in progress. We had a statistics service that was sort of like the lifeblood of what you did in Halo. It tracked all of your player progress. It was very much everything to do with the players. So this was game statistics, like how many games you've played, total kills, total deaths, um, and then like really, really detailed analytics per player. It also did stuff like daily and weekly challenges. So we could say like, hey, go and kill 100 grunts, which are the bad guys today, and then we'll give you some extra XP. So that kept the game sort of fresh and gave people more motivation to come and play. Uh, and then we had title files, which are our static-ish file service. So we did things like message of the day, and um, the other big thing this thing did was uh, playlists that were updated by our community team weekly or bi-weekly. Um, and this, that was things like what maps and modes you could match make into, um, stuff like that. Um, the message of the day was also something they could update and push down infrequently. So these were highly cacheable files, right? And then we also had cheat detection. So we had a real-time cheating and banning detection service that used complex event processing of streams of data from the game to detect when you were doing bad things, like modifying your, you have, if you had a modded Xbox, which means you could run unsigned code and were therefore cheating, probably. Um, or we could detect things like you were being kind of a jerk on your microphone, and then we would just push down like a mute ban, and so no one else had to hear you. <laughs> I like that one a whole lot. Um, and then we had a whole user generated content service, so Halo ships with a um, map editor called Forge. 
you could go and create new maps and also new game types. And we had some people who were really amazing at doing this, and so we wanted them to be able to share this content, and so we would upload these files to our services, and then people could go and pull them down and play them. So you could play it with your friends, and then we would also work them into community playlists, like the really popular ones, and like everyone in Halo would be playing your game if it was cool. Uh, in addition to what was on Box, or what was shipped with just the game, we had uh, our experience for like the rest of the Halo universe is called Halo Waypoint, so that encompasses like an Xbox app, uh, a website, and mobile and um, tablet devices or applications. Um, and this was sort of like the ESPN of Halo in addition to a lot of community things, but we had a ton of data, so, and we were calculating very like sort of real-time analytics of this stuff sort of all on the fly, or real-ish time, I should say. Um, and so you can sort of see, like, this is everything about your player. If you went to Halo Waypoint, you could see that. Uh, you could drill down even farther and see things about, like, what your team results were, what last map you played on, like, um, breakdown per game type. And then you could drill down even farther and even see, like, you know, how accurate you are with, like, certain weapons. And so we had, like, a ton and ton of data to process just per player on the fly. Okay, so to give you guys a sense of scale that we knew we were going up when we had to rewrite these services, um, Halo 1 had about 6.5 million units sold, so you're going to get more unique users than that, but because of resale and everything like that. Uh, Halo 2 had about 8.5, and, and Halo 3 had almost 12 million uh, copies sold. And then um, Halo 3 and Halo Reach, while they came out later, were sold slightly less, but they were also not mainline Master Chief games. So we were looking more at the, like, the trajectory of sales based on um, the mainline games, because this was going to be like the return of Master Chief. Uh, in addition, we also knew that Halo 2 and Halo 3 each had over 2 million copies sold on day one. So basically, people pre-order games, and then, or go and stand in line at midnight and buy it, and then they go online Im immediately. So that's cool, because you get a lot of people hitting your services on day one. Um, there are no dark rollouts in the games industry. Um, so what ended up happening is we actually had an incredibly, incredibly successful launch, especially for the games industry. We had no major outages. We had no major downtime. Um, on day one, we had one million unique players come online and play. In week one, we had four million unique players come online and play, and they played 31.4 million hours of gameplay. And then this number is actually from June of 2013, because I don't have anything more public to share with you. But we had 11.6 million unique players online, 1.5 billion games of Halo were played for a combined total of 20, 270 million hours of gameplay. Um, people also had like 11.7 billion kills, 388 million headshots, 193 million assassinations, and 64 me million vehicles were hijacked. So people played Halo, and they really liked it. And we had a really successful launch. And, um, we stayed up, which was like really great because this is actually, I don't know how much you guys pay attention to the games industry, but this is not like a thing that happens. Like some, another really popular game, and I'm not gonna name names, but they shipped that same holiday, and I know one of the designers there, and, and he happened to tweet out that, sorry guys, we're having, an, um, we're having some downtime because we broke the internet. And I sort of messaged him back, and I was like, really, did you break the internet, or did your service just fall over? Um, <laughs> I was feeling pretty pleased with myself at that point because we had launched correctly. He's a good friend. He took it well. Um, anyway, so some of the architectural challenges we faced. Um, obviously, we have these like crazy load patterns. So this is not real data. Um, but basically, <laughs> this is, I can't give you real data because they would be mad at me. Um, but it illustrates the point of essentially you go from zero to hundreds of thousands of concurrent users online at once. And this is generally like that first spike happens within 48 hours, usually for a AAA game, because it's like a blockbuster movie, right? Like um, you have worldwide release dates, you have lengthening marketing campaigns to generate awareness. Um, and then you'll taper off over time because people will play something else or they'll have other things to do and you'll hit spikes around Christmas when everyone gets Halo for Christmas and goes online um, or like when you release new content like map packs um, or like when we ran a tournament where we gave away a Ford, it wasn't a Ford, it was a truck that looked like the Warthog which was the vehicle in the game that was like the prize. So a lot of people wanted that, turns out. Um, Anyway, so this is kind of crazy, and I'll come back to how we dealt with this more later. One of the challenges is obviously being on physical hardware like the uh, original services were for the prior Halo games, and on one giant SQL server was like not going to cut it anymore because we were already at the, the capacity where we were going to have to shard that SQL server, and so we figured since we had to do that work and build something that would like power the future of Halo, we should maybe go and do something that um, was going to scale a little better, especially for our super small team. And, um, and then also we wanted to just like not have to order a bunch of boxes that were essentially sitting around doing nothing for the lifespan of like their, like after launch, like you don't even use like, you use about a quarter of them, right? So we went to Azure's cloud um, 
we use Azure Worker Roles, uh, which is Compute, Azure Table, which is a key value store, Azure Blob, Blob Service, and then Azure Service Bus, which is a distributed messaging queue. Um, and that worked really great for us. We were also internal to Microsoft, so we were able to like talk to the people there and, and deal with the fact that like when we came on board, I think Azure was at like 1.3, 1.4, so still pretty new and put, pushed a lot of improvements back into the system. Um, the other biggest challenge is we essentially had to always be available. Um, while we were not in the mainline gameplay path, like um, packets from gameplay were not going through our services, that was peer-to-peer, -peer. we were in, in the way of you actually getting into a game and starting to play, and so we didn't want to block you from doing that because people just want to play Halo, and they don't want to... They don't want to have to deal with like waiting for the server to be available, so like we couldn't go down. Um, in addition, we were using the original Halo game engine that had evolved over like the years, right? But it was built right before the internet was maybe mostly a thing, and Xbox Live 100% wasn't a thing. I mean, the internet was a thing, obviously in 2001, but like Xbox Live and online gameplay wasn't really a thing, um, and then it evolved over time, and so it wasn't really like tolerant to network failures or uh, or service failures. Um, it was sort of like bootstrapped on, and like we didn't even have a real HTTP client on the Xbox until 2011, 2010, and we weren't allowed to take it because it took up too much memory. Um, so uh, uh, it basically like they weren't our, our client was not going to tolerate us saying no very well, uh, and we knew that. So returning stale data was better than returning no data. We always had we also had low latency and high concurrency requirements. Obviously, we're in the way of the game. We don't want to be down. We don't want to block people. We also have our clients are incredibly chatty and they do a lot of things at about the same time and they send it to us. And we also had multiple clients, so uh, you run into concurrency issues for things that need to be correct, right? So we looked at like right. You start with a stateless three tier architecture with a stateless front end and a stateless middle tier and a storage layer. This is sort of like what the original services were. Uh, you have some latency issues if you have to go to storage round trip, duh. And then you add a cache um, to be faster, which is cool, and maybe that sort of solves your problem. But if you have really, really high concurrency issues, um, caches now reintroduce concurrency, concurrency issues back into your system because a lot of them don't have the same semantic um, guarantees and cons consistency guarantees that uh, an underlying storage layer will have. And so you either have to write some cache manager or implement con a concurrency control protocol, which all introduces latency back into your system. Um, so in addition, data locality is also not a thing that you get with caches, right? Like that whole like state list, everything is built on the data shipping paradigm where you're shipping data around and then doing some compute on it and then like throwing it away essentially. Um, but for Halo, especially with all of those like statistics that we were processing on the fly, you would upload some data to us and then later we'd have to go and like to answer any of those website queries or just send stuff back to the game, we'd have to pull a ton of data off of out of storage and then like process it. And so we wanted data locality. We wanted to think of our model more in the function shipping paradigm where all of the data would live somewhere because you're pretty lo localized to wherever you're playing and then you know, run some code there and then hopefully like the data, uh, and that, that would get us better latency issues and then um, it would just be faster overall and easier to manage. So we started looking around at different things and we came across like the actor model which is a model from 1970s that was actually released in an artificial intelligence paper. Um, but it's since been repurposed for the distributed systems community. Uh, and it's a framework and basis for reasoning about concurrency. Uh, the key uh, idea here is you have actors, which are concurrent units of computation. Actors can only communicate with one another via asynchronous message passing. And so the biggest challenge they're solving is there's no shared state throughout the system. And so you can't accidentally modify someone's state and have these race conditions because the actor controls all of its state. So it's all the state is localized to the thing operating on it. Actors communicate by sending asynchronous messages. When they get a message, they can send another message, they can create new actors, um, or they can change their internal state. Um, and essentially what you end up creating with actors is state full services. Um, and so this is kind of nice because it, it can also give you data locality. So if you keep the data around and can partition your data in such a way that each actor is in control of its own data, uh, you get a stateful middle tier with performance benefits of a cache um, and data locality, but you can also achieve consi uh, semantic consistency benefits of more encapsulated entities. And so this was really nice and we sort of really liked this idea because we had highly partitionable data sets, i.e. players. Um, and we needed data locality. And so we started looking around, and there are other actor models out there like Erlang and ACA, um, but we found this Microsoft Research Group inside of, um, or this project Orleans inside of Microsoft Research um, from the Extreme Computing Group, and we partnered up with them in the summer of 2011 to sort of start working with this. This is um, actually the paper that they published in March of 2014. Sorry, 2013? Um, nope, 2014, got my dates wrong. Um, <laughs> 
So March 2014, um, that details the, the, the framework and um, a lot of the services and stuff that we shipped on. So if you want to know more, I highly recommend reading it. It's a really great paper. Um, but Orleans is a runtime and programming model for building distributed systems based on the actor models. This was kind of exactly what we wanted. Um, it obviously had a bias towards .NET and C Sharp, which was great for us being inside of Microsoft. And, um, and then it also had this really, it was, had a programming model that was also incredibly nice for asynchronous programming. Um, and it also had a runtime that solved a lot of hard distributed systems problems for you. And so this sounded really great because at this time, I think we were six people on this tiny, tiny services team. And we needed something to help us out. And we didn't have a huge, like we were doing our own DevOps as well, right? So in Orleans, an actor is called a grain. I will use the terms interchangeably because grain has been baked into my mind. Actors um, are uniquely identified by a type and a unique ID. Um, and when one is in memory, it is called an activation, just for some terminology. So the really cool thing about Orleans that differentiates itself from a lot of other actor models out there is this concept of virtual actors. So in Orleans, an actor always exists. It's virtually, it's never explicitly created or destroyed. Uh, you have no control over a grain life, or actor life cycle as a developer like you, like you have to explicitly do in some of the other models. So there's a couple ideas to understand about virtual actors. Um, that we're gonna go over. You have this idea of perpetual existence, right? Never, you can't create it or destroy it, it's just a virtual entity. Uh, because of this, the runtime handles automatic instantiation for you. So basically, if um, an actor is not in memory when you talk to it or send it a message, the runtime will bring it up in memory on a machine that has space to deal with it. Uh, and then it will also deactivate uh, actors as well when you no longer need them or no one is talking to them. So that's, really nice to deal with. You don't have to do any of this special code as a developer. Um, in addition, the concept of location transparency is really huge to virtual actors. This is the idea that um, actors are not deterministically placed within a cluster. They are either sometimes on a machine or sometimes not on a, uh, on a different machine or maybe in, uh, not in memory at all. And so this is sort of like the idea of when you send me a message on my cell phone, like a text message, you don't actually care where I'm at in the world, you just have my unique identifier, which is my phone number, and you send me a message and the cell network deals with routing it to wherever I happen to live. So that's a super nice concept to deal with and allows the um, Orleans runtime to do a lot of nice things that we'll get into for you. And then uh, because there's no deterministic placing of machines, you get automatic scale out by default. Um, and you actually get this without doing a deploy. So you just modify a config setting on the fly and say like, here's some more machines for your cluster and Orleans can immediately start using them. So that's also a really nice release valve to have to just throw more boxes at the problem and not have to do a redeploy or re anything. Um, so Orleans does a lot of nice things for you because it has its own runtime. The runtime is composed of the messaging, hosting, and execution system. You tell Orleans, you're like, hey, here's a bunch of machines, um, a cluster of servers. Uh, Orleans often refers to that as a set of silos. Uh, they will run the container process, which runs all of the runtime stuff, and then it will also run your um, actor code as well. The messaging system connects each set of servers in, in the system with a single persistent TCP connection and manages that connection for you. Um, it also handles message serialization as well. They went and wrote their own serializer that's incredibly fast, which is great. Um, and then they deep copy messages as well so that you have isolation guarantees um, so that you can't accidentally modify state. The hosting system decides where to place active grains. This does a lot of the magic for you because it is a distributed hash table that is actually AP, which is like I think one of the coolest things in Orleans. Um, and so it's allowed to, uh, so while you don't have strong consistency guarantees, it does allow it to do a lot of nice things and always be available. Um, it also does things like if a server is under memory pressure, it'll go kill off some grains on that machine and then just put them somewhere else. So the runtime manages like hotspots for you. Um, it also deals with the execution. Actors are by default single threaded execution within, within an actor and so you don't have to worry about writing concurrent code inside of a single actor. You're also by default guaranteed that you only have one message processing inside of an actor at any given time so you also don't have to worry about interleaving. There are actually a lot of knobs and stuff we push back into Orleans that like you can do that but those are more advanced maneuvers um, if you need to tune for performance for spe specific use cases. And then once again, there's a programming model. I'm not gonna go super deep into it, um, but this is sort of like how you would define a grant, uh, an actor interface, and then there's like how you go implement it and stuff like that. But it looks like you're writing C-sharp, uh, basic C-sharp, you're using the task programming language. It's pretty great, it's really easy. It does a lot of code gen for you to generate um, the factory methods to allow you to do virtual actor references and do all the message passing for you. You just sort of write object-oriented code like you're used to writing. Okay, 
So um, reliability is a big key component of this Orleans runtime. It manages all of it for you. So let's talk about how it kind of does that. Um, basically, you end up with these, uh, you have a machine set of silos, and they're all running grain code. Uh, and you have you know, your individual grains running, and then um, they're all doing things on in memory. And then one of your machines dies, or goes down, or enters a partition. And that's fine. And like, Orleans just like spins the grains up on another machine the next time that you need them, and, and that's great. And so like as soon as someone else sends a message to A, B, or C, Orleans will activate it on another machine that has space. Um, and this is great because if it was deterministically placed, you would have to like actually go and bring that machine up or add a new machine to the cluster, which is slow, right? Because then those grains can't do anything, and if that's corresponding to you as a player, you're probably going to be sad because you can't play Halo for a while. Um, and then also like things like uh, it would just you don't have to wait for like a box to spin up or anything like that. It just places it somewhere else. And then if that machine does come back up, it will rejoin the cluster, um, and then Orleans will just start add, allocating stuff back to it. And like the world is great, and I didn't get paged in the middle of the night, and that's super awesome. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the performance and scalability of this. Orleans actually set out with two main goals. It was to do developer productivity, which is why they focused a lot on the programming model, and then also to perform and scale incredibly well, um, which was great for us. So one of the, the really cool things about Orleans is, and some of this is because of the virtual actorness and non-deterministic placing of grains, is that it runs at incredibly high CPU utilization. Um, and so you essentially, in the paper they quote 90% CPU utilization without any instability. In practice, we ran our boxes at about 95% CPU utilization in production without any instability. So it's really cool because you get to use the whole box that you paid for, which is awesome. And then when you need more boxes, it's like really easy to justify getting more boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, right? Um, so that's awesome. And then the other really awesome thing is Orleans achieves near linear scale out. Um, so this is a, a, a graph from the paper, and I will go into detail explaining it. But essentially, what they did is they took the ha actual Halo 4 present service, which is doing like real work. It's doing a heavy bit of compute, and then it's also um, doing two network hops or two calls to different grains. Uh, and they're running it at 95 to 97% CPU utilization with a million actors. And then they're just like, you know, slamming it with requests and seeing how high of a throughput they could get. And then they would add more machines and do it again and see as it scales. And you can, and they ran up to, up to 125 boxes, and each one of those boxes was running eight cores. So this is like actually serious compute happening, and it's scaling linearly. So this is not like an academic, like, oh, we ran it, and theoretically it scales. Like, and we only like actually tested this up to eight machines. We tested this up to 125 boxes, each running eight cores. And for us, because of this, um, I really love this because we were on a super tight schedule. Um, you have to hit your date, and so if we could just throw hardware and money at the problem and then optimize later, that was super awesome. And so this was like kind of one of the key things for us to hitting our deadline is we knew we could just throw more boxes at the problem. Okay, and then I also want to mention that we're in a distributed systems world, so Orleans is AP means it chooses to always be available. So there are gotchas if you. Um, are gonna pick this up and use it. Um, basically, you can get into a split brain mode where you have two grain activations of the same type and fa certain failure scenarios. If you care, you have to deal with that. Um, we 100% did, like our statistic service is correct, but also built on top of an AP system. It's a whole nother talk on how we did that, but it's it's definitely doable and it was worth the trade off. Whereas most of our other systems, we like just didn't care because presence was gonna update all the time and so it would eventually figure itself out. Okay, so. Uh, just to sort of like recap why Orleans is awesome, uh, you can build stateful services that scale, and that's really cool, right? Because I think a lot of the focus on industry has been like, let's build stateless things, and then we can automate, we can by default scale them out. But this gives us a model to build stateful services that scale. Um, the virtual actor abstraction, even if you aren't going to use Orleans, is something that can be used on top of other actor models, and is really great because it gives us a way to allow like the runtime to solve some of the distributed systems and management of our cluster problems for us instead of having to have people involved in the mix. Um, and then I really like it because building self-healing frameworks is awesome because I get to sleep through the night. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the systems that we built in Orleans and Halo and give you sort of like a high level architecture of what we did. Um, pretty much all of our Orleans systems looked like this. We had our um, own dispatch or front end system that we wrote called our dispatcher. That was actually written in F sharp because IIS was too slow. So we needed something a little more lightweight. Um, 
And so that was like an Orleans client because it could call into the grain. So we had HTTP requests coming from the game into our front end, which would then forward the requests on into our state full services, which were our Orleans silos running grains. And then sometimes that would do a query out to persistent storage. Some of them also did not. Um, and then sometimes they would get data back uh, and it would return a response and then that would get converted into an HTTP response. So we weren't doing like crazy RPC all the way down to the client because that's a bad time. Um, so that's like pretty much what our general services looked like. Uh, this is the Halo 4 statistics service, or a very uh, a, a brief overview of it. Um, this is the service that I wrote. Um, so I don't have the dispatcher in here, but basically when you were playing a game, um, like a multiplayer or a ca campaign game, or any kind of game, the Xbox would start sending us statistics, and we would aggregate all this data in a game grain. Um, I'm gonna also ask you to spend, suspend your disbelief and pretend that none of this fails. There was a whole replay mechanism built in between, but it's more complicated than worth getting into right now. Um, so the data would get aggregated in the game grain. Uh, once we got an end of game event, we would merge all of that and persist it to blob storage so that we could do stuff with it later. Um, if we wanted to like make a really, really deep dive site on Waypoint, which I think we did later, you could go and use that. It would then send a message to every player who happened to be in that grain and be like, here's the data, you need to update your own stats. Uh, those player grains, were treat, we treated them like right through caches. So all of the data that you had aggregated like while you were playing or anything that um, we need to rehydrate from memory, we did, and so you just updated your internal statistics and then you wrote them out durably to Azure table storage before returning um, and saying success. If this failed at any point during along the way, we had a mechanism to replay and retry until all of these pieces succeeded. We were able to do that because we had idempotent operations um, all the way down, and so that just made our lives a lot better. What's also interesting to note about this is, right, we had 1.5 billion games of Halo played, but I didn't have to write any code to do manage these game grains or like figure out how long to keep them in memory or life cycle or like guess when to deactivate them, right? Orleans just would be like, no one's talked to you for a while, so like deactivate and kill yourself. Um, same with the player game. Same with the player game. <laughs> um, so like, right, we had 11.6 million players. They obviously all weren't in memory consuming resources at once because our user base is very transient. Um, but as soon as you came online, your grain would get spun up as soon as the game started talking to us about you, and so then um, you would consume resources only for when you were online, and like once you went offline, no one was talking, the game was no longer talking to us, and so then your player grain would go away. And that was cool, because the runtime just gave it to us for free. Um, so if you're interested in Orleans, it is actually open source on GitHub right now. Um, as of January, I'm real excited about that, because took a long time to happen. They're also actively developing it still. Um, like for instance, it's still be, the Halo services are still being built on top of that. Um, they just released the Streams API. Uh, they're accepting pull requests. Um, also, if you like Linux and other things, uh, the .NET Core project is the open source version of the CLR, and um, they're not fully compatible with .NET 4.5 yet, but the idea is that the CLR will compile down to Linux and Mac OS, and so they are doing that open in the environment, and there is a goal also eventually to make Orleans .NET Core compatible and move it onto that when they have all of the features that Orleans needs to support it, so in theory, you could go and run Orleans on Linux and life would be great. Um, okay. So let's do some tales from production because I showed you that really scary graph and I bet you're wondering how we stayed up. Um, so uh, just, we did our own DevOps, right? We were a really tiny team. We grew from like six to 30 people at launch, but realistically that was like 30 people who like 15 of those joined within the last two months before launch. So we were running all of our stuff in PaaS. Um, I like DevOps and I like the combined model because basically it forces you to make good decisions because otherwise you're the one who gets woken up later. Um, and then obviously we had this crazy, crazy load pattern. So if you take anything away from this talk, like don't do this if you don't have to because it sucks. Um, <laughs> Um, it's also really scary, and um, I don't suggest doing that. Do things like other people talk about, like feature flags or deciders or dark rollouts or canaries. All of those things are so awesome. Um, doing this is not awesome, even though we stayed up. Like, don't do that. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story about no data, like prod data, which I like to call AKA Halo 4 launch night was not the first time Azure and Orleans saw production data. So pretty much I've talked about Orleans before, but I've actually never really mentioned that like, I think people might think that we launched everything for the first time and it saw prod data on like 
uh, in November of 2012 when Halo 4 went live. And we were not at all comfortable with that happening because we basically adopted a stack of all new technology, which is exciting as a developer because you're like, yay, new technology. And then it's terrifying because you're like, oh my god, we have to run this in production and no one else has. So like we adopted MSR, Microsoft Research Technology with Orleans, which had never been productionized. We adopted Azure, which was really um, you know, at 1.3, I think, when we got onto it. So, and we were going to be their largest customer at the time. And then we wrote our own front end, so like we had a real high tolerance for risk. And so if you aren't really scared right now, you 100% should be. Um, so what we did to alleviate some of this terror and make people feel better about what was happening is we uh, started working with the Orleans team in June, July of 2011, and we set a goal that by that winter, we would have replaced the Halo Reach present service. So this was a game that got launched in 2010, I believe. And the present service that they had was very, very similar to the Halo 4 present service. So we could, and the prod data was not as, like, right, it trickled off. So we were at a more reasonable load. So we were like, okay, let's go replace this thing. Um, and we actually chose the service also, too, because it's fairly low business impacting and risk. Uh, the worst thing that happens is if it falls over and, like, our servers catch on fire is that you, like, can't see the, the hopper counts. The number of people in certain playlists at a given time would be wrong. But you could still match make correctly. Like, this was just a totally a UI bug. And so it didn't affect gameplay. Um, and, then, and then we could fall back over to the current in, like, the current Halo Reach present system or um, that actually falls back again to the Halo or the Xbox Live present service. There were like layers of redundancy built into this. We still felt pretty okay about trying all this new technology on here and getting some real prod traffic at it. So the Halo presence and reach presence service looks like this. It sends you a bunch of data from the Xbox. Uh, our router grains are, are stateless workers that deserialize a bunch of stuff and then it gets routed to the game grain or the play, and the players get notified. And if you connect a second screen device via Halo Waypoint, you can observe what's happening in real time. Um, from the updates in games. So you could like, we actually had another little like client companion app that went out with this that you could see like, oh, like all of my team members on this map are here and it would update in real time. Um, and we stressed and perf tested this really hard before we went out. I think that original perf test like started back in like 2011, or the fall of 2011, we were working with the Orleans guys. Uh, they actually ran that perf test every time they gave us a new build on our service, which was cool. So we knew we were gonna scale, but what we, actually found in production is that we had a fairly major memory leak um, in the Orleans framework. And um, right, like we just hadn't found that in our internal testing. And so this was kind of painful because it was over the holidays and we were literally um, VIP swapping the, or like spinning up a new service like side by side and then like switching all traffic to the new service and then memory dumping the old one and then killing it every eight hours, which is really fun during Christmas and New Year's. Um, but <laughs> But, but it kept us from going out um, in November of 2012 with this bug in multiple services, and we didn't have to deal with it then. The other really great advantage of going out into prod early, like in a sort of dark way, was we got to practice DevOps. So right, uh, almost no one on our team had done cloud development before. This was still sort of new. Most people were still used to, like, you had your box that you SSH'd into and, like, grabbed the logs and grepped through them, and that's how you, like, manage services. Um, because it was still at a somewhat lower scale. And so we got practice using um, all of our new debugging and alerting and logging and metrics tools. Also, we got uh, used to like just our technology. Like, what are you even supposed to be watching for like in Orleans? Like, what counters are valuable to detect that you're having an incident or like to get in front of an incident? Um, so basically, if you have to go big on launch day, find a way that you can kind of get some prod data into your system before you have to. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story about validating dependencies. So this sort of goes back to, we're in a world where we adopt a lot of open source or we adopt a lot of service providers and we sort of think like, oh, they have SLAs, that's great. Um, I can totally rely on them. I would not recommend that. Um, I would recommend that if you were gonna take a heavy dependency on anything, you should test the crap out of it because like at the end of the day, like if Halo would have gone down because of any of our dependencies, like we were the ones who were gonna get blamed and lose money and maybe someone else would also get some flack, but like we were the ones who lost out, right? So we picked up Azure Service Bus as a core piece of, um, of our, which is a distributed messaging queue as a core dependency for our statistics service. This allowed us to do a lot of the replay that I talked about in the statistics service so that we could um, never lose data. And so there was like some Saturday in the summer of 2012 where we're running this really like heavy stress test against Azure Service Bus to just sort of see what happened. Um, and in addition, it was gonna go eventually hopefully go back through to our stats system. But we sort of start seeing that like our instances are dying and like falling over and that's kind of sucks and we got a little bit sad. But then I got a phone call that was like, stop what you're doing right now. Um, 
And then they kind of asked, like, well, what were you guys doing? Um, and so it turned out that not only had we taken our own instances of Azure Service Bus down, we'd also taken everyone around us down. Um, so that was bad, but we found it early, right? It was probably bad for everyone else who didn't stress test their dependencies. Um, but we found it early enough for us that we were able to work with them to fix some of the, the scale and load issues. Um, and they were also able to fix a lot of their isolation issues so that like the noisy neighbor problem wasn't as big of an issue going forward. They weren't able to fix that entirely. And so we, we sort of knew that and, and, we, and we backed up our backup later, but I'll get to that in a second. But basically all this goes to is um, my friend Jeff Hodges, who also used to be at Twitter, uh, did this in October of 2012. So we were doing this in June, I would like to point out. Um, but he, he made this, he wrote this tweet and he's like, who owns your availability? It's like 100% not your service provider. Um, and he made this website that if you go and click on it, literally just says you. <laughs> it's great. I highly recommend going and hitting it. And he's probably going to yell at me after this talk. Um, anyway. Like, right, like, it's up to you to provide availability for your service and to decide, like, how much redundancy and reliability and, like, failure you can manage. Um, okay, so then we backed up our backup as well, right? We knew we could not lose data and statistics because as soon as you do that, people get super mad and it's always the best game they've ever had and they're really upset and they go and, like, bitch online. So, like, you have to just, like, you don't want to lose data. And so we didn't want to lose data. So while we, if you think of Azure Service Bus as our backup to like the original message skinning process uh, failed, we use Azure Service Bus to replay. If we could not put things on our Azure Service Bus queue, we actually automatically had it built in that it fell back to Azure Blob Storage. Um, and so we made sure that we basically had to have two major services failing before we were going to lose data. Turns out, we didn't lose data, but they both decided to be a pain in the butt on the same week when I happened to be on call um, in the spring after we had launched the game, where Azure Service Bus was having issues because of, it has a dependency on SQL Azure that I don't want to get into, but it was like not the right decision to make. And they're moving away from it, and they like were having a lot of outages, and so we would like periodically, or we, were, we were just seeing, it's like the worst part where you're on call and your like, dependencies are down, and you're like, yep, I know I really can't do anything about it. Um, but we're seeing this happen, but then we were just noticing that, like, hey, it fell over to blob storage. Great, we would just pick it up and reprocess it later. So people saw statistics coming in later, um, but we never lost data. You always got your stats updated eventually. And then on that Friday, when Service Bus finally got their stuff figured out and were fine, Azure Storage as a whole, so blob and key value store, um, actually had a fairly major outage because they forgot to push out their um, new SSL certs. And so no one, no one could talk HTTPS to Azure Storage. And that kind of sucked, um, turns out. So that was a super fun week to be on call, but, but we never lost data. Um, so I was real pleased with myself once again because we never lost data and we were like, wow, we had like incidents and like uh, there were issues, we, we never lost anyone's stats, which was really, really cool. Okay, and then my last story for you is clients are jerks, AKA remember the time the game DOSed us at launch. So um, if you think you can trust internal clients, I want to tell you a story about how you cannot trust your own clients, um, let alone like clients out there in the wild if you're just providing an API. So I wrote the cheating and banning service, the real-time cheating and banning service. This was a service that analyzed streams of data from the game that we got from like various resources like of things that were happening that you were just sending us data anyway, so you probably weren't going to muck with it. Um, and then we like ran some rules on it, and then in real time we'd push down a ban and, uh, when we detected that you were probably being a bad person. Um, so the game also wanted to be super helpful and was like, hey, I'm going to tell you when I think I'm cheating. And this is like the Xbox running in the cheater's house. So like the chances of this data being right, I was like super suspect of anyway. But I'm like, cool, you can have this API where you push this data up to us. And then I'll like factor this into the equation, right? Um, and then the other super fun story about this service is this got written in the last month and a half before we went to launch and the game had already gotten gold, which means the disks are being stamped. They'd passed Xbox Live certification. The game team mostly went home because they had also been working incredibly hard to hit their deadline. Um, but with services, you can do whatever you want all the time, which is great and bad. Um, and so, so like, I didn't get any time to start writing this because the more prior, like, to be fair, the, the heavily prioritized services that were very, very core to Halo gameplay were being prior prioritized first. And those got done and done very, very well. So I start writing this and I'm, I'm looking at this endpoint. I'm like getting some answers about like, oh, we're gonna call you about this many times per second. And then like we doubled that and I think like quadrupled it because I'm like, I don't believe you. And, um, and then we allocated for that and, and, and we'd sort of tested it, but like we also didn't have a ton of test resources because it also all gone home. Um, and, and so we go out on launch night and this thing was super over allocated, but it totally worked except for that the game started 
essentially sending us an order of magnitude request at this API, um, or, or an order of magnitude more request at this API. And so we just hadn't sharded out our storage. We like didn't have enough storage capacity to deal with this. And so we start returning 500s because we're blowing all of our IOPS and Azure storage. And um, and then when you send the game of 500 back, it's like, oh, I'm going to retry three times. And so that totally <laughs> exacerbated the problem. <laughs> And we actually started, and unfortunately, we also had something else on the same storage account, so it did affect, we had a, like a, a very, very minor outage. But we had this thing in our dispatcher, we, or we had a bunch of release valves where I could essentially go and modify a, config, a dynamic config value without having to do a redeploy, where I could lie to the client. I'd be like, I totally have this 200 drop on the floor. Um, <laughs> We also had the ability to divert some of this traffic, or we also had flips that could say like any, you know, like HTTP error code you wanted, or divert all of the traffic to just write to blob storage or something like that. These are super, hand super handy. Lie to your clients, it's great. Um, and what ended up happening is there was some bug. This thing like just wasn't fully tested because they had other priorities, and like what they were sending us was just garbage. So we ended up leaving this off after we went and um, uh, looked at this in, in service, but basically, you know, it was nice that we had this release valve to do this, and like clients aren't jerks, they're all very nice people, and I actually really loved everyone I worked with on the Halo team. They just have different priorities than you do as a service, even if they are internal, right? Like you all wanna make a great product and app, but they are generally focused on other things that are not like you being really available, because they're like, that's 100% your problem, I'm just gonna try and get what I need from you to do what I need to do. So I highly recommend dynamically configurable release valves. I highly recommend ones where you can just lie to the client on the fly because that allows you to pull the switches. We also basically had a plan going in that said, these are the core things that have to stay up for people to be able to play Halo, and it's actually a very small number of things. Kill everything else when things start going bad, and we like had this order of like, yep, can I go kill that off? Yep, go do it, or like not, to protect everything else. Um, also, back pressure in your system is really great. Um, do that, like teach your services to say no before they f totally fall over. Uh, if you can do that, that's awesome. You should also tell your clients like to back off if you can build that in and get that into the API so that they don't hammer you with retries. Um, that's generally harder than it sounds because it's an extra feature and priorities and things like that, so just lie to your clients. Um, um, and basically the moral of the story is protect your services, right? Like once again, like even if they are in-house apps, they're not going to behave nicely all the time. And it's not that they're being malicious, it's just that like the stuff that we do is hard and sometimes we write bugs in our code and like it, everyone should just protect their own, right? Okay. So um, this is fine. Well, I hope you found some of these stories amusing and informative, but let's wrap this up. I want to close out with just some ideas about where we are. Building distributed systems isn't hard, and it's really hard, or is hard at scale, and it's hard to run them in production. It's really great to see a conference where people will like openly talk about where they have failed so that we can all learn from them, because that's how we move forward as an industry. I know it's really fun to be super snarky on Twitter, and I do this sometimes, but like maybe we should be nicer and like just treat this stuff as like it's hard, and we should learn from these things um, and just move on from there and like and like maybe remove a little bit of the ego from the equation. Um, that's also hard to do. But anyway, we also have this world called the cap theorem that we live in. It's also not just a theorem, it's a proof um, for people who like to argue with me about this. Uh, I like to call this why we can't have nice things in distributed systems. <laughs> But basically it means that we live in a world where you can have, the, the, the theorem states there are three properties in distributed systems, consistency, linearizable consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, and you can only build systems that um, have two of them. And then you don't not get to pick partition tolerance because we live in the real world in physics. I know like maybe all of you know this, but like the amount of arguments I get into about this, like still today in databases who claim to be CA is astounding to me. So like you have to pick P and then you can choose consist consistency or availability. So basically, we live in a world of trade-offs, right? Um, if you don't think you're making a trade-off, you're 100% making one and you just don't know and it's gonna hurt you a whole lot later. Um, so, like, know where you're making trade-offs and explicitly call them out. Um, this helps you build better services and it also helps you monitor them because you know where your failure domains are and you know where you're gonna fail and you can build redundancy and extra liability into your system or at least to be like, this is gonna happen and this is what we do when it happens. Um, I really believe that the only systems that have, uh, like, a chance at all of surviving in productions are the ones that clearly acknowledge and articulate this trade-off. Um, and then finally, like right, I mentioned, you're choosing between consistency or availability. Programming against consistent linearizable systems is much easier to reason about and develop against. I 100% get that. Um, it also means by definition that these systems are not available under failure modes. Um, 
I want to argue that available systems are often better for users and business value. Um, many businesses have really real monetary consequences of use or user retention problems during major outages. Um, and so often we can give up on linearizable consistency and, and adopt weaker forms of consistency and take compensating actions to fix uh, consistency issues that pop up due to choosing availability um, and then like do those offline or do those via customer support or ideally do them via automation in your system. Um, and then those will make users happy versus like them trying to pull up your app or use your service and it's just not available. Um, I think in the industry right now, we rely too heavily on consistency and consensus in many major systems. Um, a lot of the times you hear people are just like, oh, just throw a zookeeper at it, which like sometimes that is 100% the right decision. I am not advocating that we don't do this because they're like, like I want my database to be consistent. I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there um, most of the time. Uh, there are worlds where I will trade that off. But um, what I want us to take away from this is that I think we need to step back more often than we currently do and think, can we actually just make an available system and adopt a weaker form of consistency? Um, there's a ton of really interesting research being done in this space, like CRDTs and ramp transactions and like way more than that. Um, it's just great. And they, these people are like working on solutions to make it easier to build available systems that are also correct, um, right? Um, basically, I hope that like what I want you to take away from this bit is that you and your users, it's all, for you and your users, it's often worth making your system more available and spending the extra effort to make it AP. We did this in Halo. Um, most of our systems didn't have high consistency, const or consistency constraints, but um, the statistics one did. And we built an entirely correct, eventually consistent statistics service on top of an AP system, and we never lost data, right? Um, so it's totally possible, and I think it's often worth the extra effort. Um, and that's all I got. Do you guys have questions? Hello. Uh, hi, Kitty. Awesome talk. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I got two questions for you. One is when do we when will we have the one click tweet button to share the game clips directly on Twitter, <laughs> rather than going to Upload Studio and then you share it. But it, I don't. I don't actually. I so I've been at Twitter for two months. So we, I'm just, I'm I just, actually don't. I like. I'm really not capable of answering most Twitter questions. Gonna, <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And the second question is. Uh, I just. I'm just curious to know that how is your like a seven mile high view? Okay. I'm not going to go in detail. But how the monitoring model you have for when you have when you detect the issues because it looks like people get in very pressurized situations when there are releases. So can you just give a hint of that, like how you actually do that? Like what we were actually monitoring things? How things get yeah. worse, break, and everything. Um, so, so the question essentially was like, how do we monitor and log, and like what are we actually looking at to do this and do release valves? Um, I'm a huge proponent of metrics. We had metrics when we went out. I'm a huge proponent of percentiles. Use percentiles. Averages is, is generally not good enough. This is not super interesting. But um, the other thing, too, is like actually test your system and force it to fail or just throw into production if it fails, uh, like in our dark mode, and then you don't have to actually force it to fail. Find out why it's failing and find out reproducible steps to do that. We did some of that in Halo. We were under an incredible time crunch. So like unfortunately, there actually were just incidents we found out because people would complain about them on the forums. Um, a lot of the like, I mean, like high level stuff. What we were looking at is we had Orlean specific metrics about like how often things we thought were failing, um, like gossip protocol wise. Like if many many nodes were failing, then just like maybe we need to go and do something. We monitored the um, the the front end very heavily, like how many requests were failing, how many were getting 500s, things like that. Those are really easy to go do, and then it gives you an idea of when something is going bad. Also, um, memory pressure is a big one because especially like we're in a managed environment. I didn't mention this. We did have garbage collection issues that we had to go tune for. Um, I think everyone does these days if you're not running C++ or like something that doesn't have a garbage collector, stuff like that. Yeah. Hi. So uh, the question I had was uh, around the actors model you had with Arlians. Mm -hmm. uh, when I think of actors, I think of fairly small units of code. It seems like you had uh, grains, as you call them, for game sessions, for players, mm -hmm. and you didn't really control when they were spun up or down. It was kind of like managed for you by the runtime. So what were the implications as far as how stateful those grains were? Because if they need to like start up with a lot of state, presumably as they start up, they need to like go hit the database storage mm -hmm. and like load, load up all their state, and that delays how quickly you can start using them. 
And also, because you don't really get to uh, control how they're placed and all that, then maybe you have a lot of communication between the grains, like one game session needs to talk to a lot of other grains that are across the data center to talk to a lot of player grains or stuff like mm -hmm. that. So, you know, what, how, how did that Im uh, impact, like, the, your ability to uh, carry state in memory or, like, have uh, performance problems because of the communication between grains? Yeah, so, um, so our grains were like, uh, you just stored all of the data for you as a player. Um, I didn't mention this, I, I don't think, but like Orleans it, like doesn't deal with persistence for you. You have to implement that yourself. So, and they, the reason is is like that's really hard to solve at a general level, and also because um, there are many models you might want to use. Like we persisted state on every. Uh, like sometimes never, like present system never persisted state. Sometimes you would persist state on um, a, on a particular message being received. Like for statistics, we would write straight through, and then sometimes you would not, or you would want to persist state on a timer, like we did when we like had these like sort of distributed counter weird things that we had going on. Those were odd. I don't talk about them for a reason. Um, but anyway, like and then some of it's just also like structuring your code for best practices, right? Like. Uh, even though we were persisting all this state about you as a player, what was actually loaded into memory was actually not that much because most of your actions were very, very temporal. Like you were looking at the game that you just played, right? Um, if you were going to go look at the game that you played last week, then we would actually go out to storage and get that for you and then return it. And sometimes we would cache it and sometimes we didn't, depending on how old it was. Uh, or, and by cache it, I mean keep it in memory in the grain. Uh, what I advocate for with Orleans especially is there's an activate async code or method that you can write and only load what you actually have to have in memory um, at startup time because right that's going to get called and you actually don't want that to be a visible lag. Um, and then the biggest issue we actually came or found with persistent state was um, was our garbage collector issue, right? You have these sort of long-lived entities in memory for a while and so um, that got into the G2 level, which is like of the CLR garbage collector, and so um, we had some long pauses because we were storing really, we were storing too much and holding on to too much for too long, and so we actually went back and optimized it. We were only holding on to what we needed to, and, and that sort of helped us. But it's definitely doable. You like lazily load everything you need, and so then basically you're just paying the hit on the first call like you would in a stateless system, um, but then the next call it's like already cached for you. So you showed this nice graph of linear scaling of the of the system. Uh -huh. um, my question is, did you actually like test it beyond that, and did you actually encounter or figured out where the theoretical limit is, where that system actually stops being linear and falls over? Um, so I do not know that number off the top of my head. We got to that number and we're like, we're good for launch. Okay. Um, and so um, I know Sergey, who's like one of the lead developers on this, has tested it farther. There are obviously upper like the upper bounds on this. Like there's physics. I'm not proposing this is magic, um, but it does scale very, for very large numbers of cores. And so like we didn't hit it at Halo scale. So uh, yes, there's an upper bounds. I don't know it. <laughs> you can tweet at Sergey. He's he's on Twitter and he he answers things and he likes talking about this. 